I turn our attention this morning to Revelation 14. We'll be looking at the first five verses. And this is another one of those famous passages in the Bible discusses the topic of the 144,000. The identity and the activities of these 144,000 become something of cultural apocalyptic folklore. Uh, there is much mystery, but I think as we look at the details of the text, the mysteries evaporate and we get to see God's plan for a special group. We've been in dark times in our study of the book of Revelation, the darkest times of human history, the darkest of all times of human history. We have observed Satan with more direct control over the affairs of the world than ever in history. His henchmen, the Antichrist and the false prophet, wreaking havoc on the earth. You know, the Revelation 12, 13, and 14, those three chapters are an interruption in the chronology. When we left off the chronology of events in Revelation back in chapter 11, we were ushered into this behind-the-scenes opportunity to see, number one, the players involved in chapter 12, and then the activities of Satan and the Antichrist in chapter 13. And, and this morning, still part of that interlude before we pick up the details of the chronology again in chapter 15, we get a glimpse of the future. We get to see in chapter 14 a vision of the return of Christ to the earth and 144,000 choice servants of God standing on Mount Zion, standing in Jerusalem with Jesus at his return, having overcome, totally victorious. This is proleptic. That is, it's, it's getting ahead of the story. It's, it's like the punchline in the middle of the joke. And this is so critical for us. We it's almost as if God knows that we need to see the end as we've been in the mire of this dark season in our study of the book of Revelation. It's, it's a, a head turner. We get to look up and see the victory. Now listen, when it comes to Sunday morning updates of football scores, I don't want to know the outcome before I watch the game. Give me a couple of days, at least wait till Tuesday before you tell me what happened. But when it comes to the end of the world, we need to know the outcome. God gives us the outcome. He knows what he's doing. He loves his people. He seeks to give comfort, encouragements, even admonitions by the way he reveals to us what will take place in the end times. We do know the end. We want to know the end. We need to know the end. And so the five verses we look at this morning give us great hope, confidence in future victory. Let's read together these five verses we will study. John writes, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters and the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. By way of outline this morning, we'll be just highlighting ten marks of the 144,000. Ten marks of the Lamb's choice end times servants. The subject of this section of our Bible is the select group of 144,000 tribulation era believers. And the text outlines for us a series of characteristics or marks of these 144,000. But you must know that the text truly is about the Lamb. This text is about Jesus. It is about His victory and His grace. And just as we read any of the narrative sections of the Bible, we, we tend to look at the Old Testament characters sometimes as the heroes of the story, the Daniels and the Davids and the Josephs. But as we notice the Lord's grace in the lives of those godly men and women of the past, 
In each of those stories, God is the hero of the story. It is his timeline. It is his story he is weaving together, and he uses frail human means to accomplish his purposes. So even as we look back and we read Old Testament narratives of of heroes and, and faithful men and women, we recognize God as the hero of the story. So too, as we look forward to future history, these players on the scene are God's implements to highlight his glory and his grace. Let's look at the first characteristic of these 144,000. And we have to turn back to chapter 7 at the first description of them to discover that they are Jews. These are genetic Israelites. Let's read together the the other passage that details these 144,000, beginning in verse 3 of chapter 7. An angel says, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the slaves of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those having been sealed, 140,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel, from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 having been sealed, from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000, from the tribe of Gad, 12,000, from the tribe of Asher, 12,000, from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000, from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000, from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000, from the tribe of Levi, 12,000, from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000, from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000, from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000, and from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 having been sealed. And of course, that is a contrast to the next verse, verse 9 of chapter 7, where John also sees other redeemed people from the tribulation era, which will comprise both Jews and Gentiles, and ostensibly men and women. Look at verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could count. This first group not only could be counted, but was counted. This second group no one could count. The first group was from the 12 tribes of Israel. The second group is from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. And what are they? They are depicted as being in heaven in white robes, singing songs to the Lamb, singing songs to God. And then in verse 14, we discover these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. The second group are tribulation martyrs, people who believe during the great tribulation or during the tribulation period, and then are killed for their faith in Christ and end up in heaven. That's different than the 144,000 who are separated out from them by tribe and by number. We will also discover they're also separated out from that group by purpose. But make no mistake, they are Jews. And these are Jews who are not to be harmed by the judgments of God coming down on the earth dwellers. What is the time period for them? It is the opening of the seal judgments. Back in chapter 7, the tribulation had just begun. And they are there called God's slaves, that is, they are believers. And according to verse 3 of chapter 14, they are sealed on their foreheads. They are protected, that is, both from God's wrath and from Satan's wrath, and they number 144,000. We discover that they are Jews in verse 4 of chapter 14, and they are males. Uh, Take a peek at verse 4. These are the ones not defiled with women. They are virgins. Very clearly an indication that the 12,000 from each tribe by 12 tribes equal 144,000 are all Jewish males who are believers, who have been sealed at the beginning of the tribulation period. They are not the total number of Jews that will believe, nor are they the total number of Jews that will be alive at that time. Uh, We will discuss more of them. Nor are they the total number of of Jews that will um, be saved and survive and make it into the millennial kingdom. This is a specific subset of humans, a specific subset of Jews, a specific subset of Jewish males who believe during the tribulation. These 144,000 are set apart to serve Jesus in a unique way during the tribulation period. 
Let's discover next that they are victorious. Look at verse 1 of chapter 14. Then I looked. This introduces a new scene. This is a transition and a contrast from what we saw in chapter 13. And behold, this is emphatic. There's something very different about what we're looking at now. The Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. Who had been in Jerusalem in chapter 13? Standing in the very place of a rebuilt temple, declaring himself to be God and demanding worldwide worship, the Antichrist. And now John sees a new scene, and it is not the phony Christ, it is the real Christ, and he is on Mount Zion. We have seen Jesus standing earlier in the book of Revelation. He's standing in heaven in chapter 5, verse 6. He is the lamb standing as if slain. He is standing with the work of redemption finished, having purchased with his own blood people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people, and receiving all glory for his redemptive work. But here he is not standing in heaven. He is standing on the earth. There are two questions for us to understand about these victorious 144,000. Where is that and when is that? The first question is where? What is this Zion? This Mount Zion is a geographical location on the earth. Mount Zion is God's affectionate name for the city of Jerusalem in Israel. In fact, if you look at all the 162 uses of the word Zion in your Bible, you will find overwhelmingly, nearly universally, this is a reference to an actual city on the earth, and it is used by God when he is expressing warm, affectionate feelings towards Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem gets other names in your Bible. Sometimes it is called Sodom and Egypt when God is very unhappy. Oftentimes the word Jerusalem itself is used in context of judgment. But when God wants to describe the city of the the center and the hub of his government on the earth during the times of Israel and in the future, he calls it Zion. It is his term of endearment for the city. It's a term of promise rather than judgment. It is the place from which Jesus, the word become flesh, will rule the nations seated on David's throne. Listen to Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah 24, verse 23. The moon will be ashamed and the sun ashamed and Yahweh of armies will reign on Mount Zion in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. This is the place of God's personal visit on the earth to reign. Isaiah 11 says... They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Micah 4 says this, It will come about in the last days, that the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh and to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples. He will render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for war. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid for the mouth of Yahweh of hosts has spoken. What does God promise will happen? That God himself will be present in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, which will become the capital city of the world. And what will take place? Judgment, decisions, there will be nations, there will be arbitration. In other words, we're not in the eternal state yet. We're in a time period where disputes need to be worked out. And a time period where God himself will be on the earth working those things out. That leads us to the question, when? (laughs) When is that? When will Jerusalem be the capital of the world? And when will Yahweh and the flesh be seated on the throne of David, ruling the nations? 
This, of course, is referring to the return of Christ to the earth, the second coming. Do you remember in Acts 1, verse 11, when Jesus left the earth after having died on the cross and rose from the dead and spent time with his disciples, and then he left? And the angel said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. The king will return. He will come back from the sky, in the clouds, down to the earth. The time period of this scene in Revelation 14 fast forwards us to Revelation 19. Uh, Turn there in your Bibles Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11, gives us this scene. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sits on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows but himself. He is clothed with a garment dipped in blood. His name is also called the Word of God. Revelation 19 depicts Jesus coming down to the earth obliterating the armies at the battle of Armageddon and taking the beast and the false prophet and dropping them alive into the lake of fire and having Satan incarcerated for a thousand years. Zechariah 14.4 describes that scene this way. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north, the other half toward the south. And when Jesus was describing these end times events to his disciples in Matthew 24, he sat on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now I and several men from this church have stood on that very hill, on the Mount of Olives, in the garden where Jesus was with his disciples before he was crucified. And there is a a very small valley between the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Jerusalem, Zion. And I read these passages. To to fast forward in my mind to the moment when Jesus will return and that mountain will be split in half and the armies of the beast will be destroyed in the battle and the beast and the false prophet thrown alive into the lake of fire and Satan so easily incarcerated. The people of God will be rescued and the golden age of humanity will have begun. We stood there on that mountain overlooking the valley, looking into the very side of the city walls of Jerusalem that Jesus will enter victoriously. That is this scene. And in Revelation 14, we get to see these 144,000 Jews standing there on Mount Zion with Jesus in his victory. The first mention of the 144,000 was in chapter 7 at the beginning of the tribulation. And here... The same number shows up at the end of the tribulation, 144,000 still intact. It's the same number. They're in Jerusalem at Jesus' return, standing victorious. None are lost. None have defected. None have been deceived. None have taken the mark of the beast. They are Jews, they are victorious. And thirdly, this morning, they are invincible. They are invincible. Look at the second part of verse 1. Having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. This is the seal that was described in chapter 7, but given a little more detail. We're just told that they are sealed from harm in chapter 7. But here we're told what the seal is. It is the name of the lamb and the name of his father. Interesting here, you have two names together joined by one sort of singular verb that governs them both. There's a unity with the names between the Father and the Son. Uh, The Lamb and the Father are often linked grammatically like this in the book of Revelation. Sometimes it's not clear who's being referred to with names and thrones and activities. You have to understand that 
the Lord Jesus Christ is fully God. And the Bible makes no qualms about him having the titles of God and the positions of God, even sharing the name of God. And we see that here. To be marked on the foreheads with the name of God, with the name of the Father and the name of the Lamb, is a mark of ownership and security. They don't belong to the beast. They don't even belong to themselves. They belong to God. They are His, and they are secure. This particular seal of God marks them for special protection during the tribulation. They are survivors. They're untouched by the wrath of God poured out on the earth, and they're untouchable by the beast and by the wrath of the dragon. They will be preserved through the worst persecution of God's people that will ever have been faced. These are not the Jews that flee Jerusalem at the midpoint of the tribulation when the abomination of desolation takes place, when the Antichrist stands up and demands universal worship. Those are Jews who are living in Jerusalem at the time that flee to the wilderness and are protected in another way. And these 144,000 are not the Jewish and Gentile followers of Christ who will be martyred during the tribulation. These ones have been sealed for special purpose. They were sealed in chapter 7 so they could make it to chapter 19. And chapter 14, right smack dab in the middle of the description of these darkest moments, gives us a glimpse at that victory. They will be invincible. As Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah walked through the furnace of fire unharmed, as Noah plus seven emerged from the flood that destroyed the entire world unharmed, as Daniel threw the night with hungry lions unharmed, so these 144,000 will walk through the tribulation period unharmed. They will be victorious, invincible, and celebrated. Look down at verse 2. <clears throat> and I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. You have the word voice, and you have the word sound, each used two times in this verse. It's actually the same word. You just have the word sound uttered four times. And another translation detail here, the word playing their harps is literally the, the word harping. So I'm just going to reread this verse in, in sort of a uh, closer to the original sort of way. It may not be good English. I heard a sound from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the sound which I heard was like harpists harping on their harps. Harping here would be a good word. This is a sound that comes out of heaven. The sound is not taking place in the same location where Jesus and the 144,000 are standing. They are on the earth. Notice in the text, this sound comes out of heaven. And notice it is a sound like many waters. If you haven't been to Yellowstone in the summer when the, the, the winter snows are melting off and, and the Yellowstone River is just full of water and then it cascades off of Yellowstone Falls and makes such a deafening roar you can't carry on a conversation next to it. That's the picture here, a, a sound like many waters. And then it is called a sound like great thunder. You need to go to the White Mountains during monsoon season when it sounds like the thunderclouds are about 10 feet above the cabin you're in. It rattles the roof and shakes the walls. And the sound is described as, as like harpists harping on their harps. That is, it is musical and melodious. You see, a live performance by Hans Zimmer's orchestra will sound like a middle school recorder concert in comparison. This sound is impressive, beautiful, deafening, and musical. What is the point of all of this? Heaven is thrilled at the victory of Jesus and the victory of the 144,000. Heaven seems to be watching on, watching the events unfold, and there's the 144,000 sealed, marked out, protected, and victorious in the final scene. And heaven just bursts out in song. Look at verse 3. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. That is, it's not just noise here. It is lyrical. It has lyrical content. 
In the Old Testament, a new song was, was uttered with fresh lyric put to melody as a monument to some new act of God's grace or rescue. Something new happens in God's redemptive plan. His people are rescued out of some predicament and they sing a new song. If you're a songwriter, maybe you've written a new song at some fresh disclosure of God's grace in your life. The singers here are not identified, but we can do a little bit of process of elimination and narrow it down. The singers depicted here are not the 144,000. The they in verse 3 is a reference back to verse 2, which is the sound coming out of heaven. And so the the singers are not the saints on the earth at that time. The singers are also not the rebels on the earth at that time. They're saying other things, and it's not nice. The singers here are not the triune God. Uh, The singers here are not the four living beings, nor the elders who are before the throne. Why? Because in verse 4, they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. So who is it? This leaves us a couple of options. Who else is in heaven? We've, we've got the angels. Uh, they are interested in, angels long to look into the things of the gospel that we participate in. And angels are also said to rejoice when even one sinner repents. So it would be appropriate for angels to sing. There are also the redeemed in heaven. There are the Old Testament saints, not yet resurrected. There are the church age believers, resurrected, glorified, and present. And then there are the tribulation martyrs. Look back at chapter 13 and verse 15. Do you remember that the Antichrist's right-hand guy, the false prophet, it was given to him to give breath to the image of the Antichrist so that the image of the Antichrist would speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And so we have the intimation there that many will be martyred during the Great Tribulation, the last half of the Tribulation period in particular. And so the Tribulation martyrs who were highlighted back in Revelation chapter 5, singing to Jesus who purchased them with his own blood could very well be the ones singing this song here. And I think the tribulation martyrs would have a a better sense of the significance of the lyrics of this song as it relates to the victorious 144,000 because they just went through the same era. They were rescued out of it through martyrdom. What are they singing? Well, the contents of all these heavenly songs mentioned in Revelation are recorded for us. What are the words to this song? Uh, Look down at your text. This is the one song that's not recorded. This is the one song where we don't get the lyrics. We do get an explanation in the end of verse 3. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who'd been purchased from the earth. So you can't learn it. Chris can't teach you the words to this song. At least not yet. To learn here means to learn and to understand the significance of something. Uh, There's a sense in which the 144,000 uniquely get what this song is all about. They have a unique experience that only the participants could appreciate. So of all the people on the earth during the tribulation, only the 144,000 could appreciate the contents of what heaven celebrates. Heaven understands that they've been watching the scene. Tribulation martyrs catch a glimpse. But, but in terms of people on the earth, only the 144,000 described here are going to have an, an understanding and appreciation. And heaven is celebrating their victorious stand on Mount Zion with Jesus at his return. And Jesus' return here initiates his glorious rule over the earth. Think about why heaven must be celebrating in that moment. All the years of trouble for Israel. Throughout history, all of the captivities, all of the sorrows, all of the expulsions, all of the dispersions, the genocides, the atrocities, the holocausts. Think of all the years of Jewish infidelity to Yahweh. All of the idolatries, the unbelief, the self-righteousness, the stubborn hearts, Generation after generation, culminating in their rejection of their own king and Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. 
And think of all the years of a tiny remnant of belief. The apostles and, and the Jewish followers who believed in Jesus in that first generation. And, and the, the trickle of Jews who believed throughout church history. Even in our own midst, those of, of Jewish descent who believe the gospel and are part of the church now. But it has been just a trickle of faith. All the years of, of the hope of promises made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Promises to David and the prophets. But now in this scene, and heaven sees it, a choice remnant has believed in Messiah, walked through the fire, and evangelized the world. And the king returns. Just as he promised, to the very city where he was killed, to the very city where a sign was hung over his head on that cross that read, this is the king of the Jews. That place will receive their king. He returns now to right all wrongs and to rescue Israel and to rule the nations in a golden millennium of peace and righteousness and prosperity and unassailable goodness. There will be no going back from this new way of things when it starts. The thousand year reign of Messiah on the earth will culminate in a final judgment and then the ushering in of a new heavens and a new earth where sin and death and the curse will be totally eradicated for infinite eternities. This song that they sing is the anthem of a new rainbow after the flood. It is the song of the world awakening after its nightmare. And it is a marked contrast to what will have happened just prior. The apex of spiritual apostasy and arrogant blasphemy of humanity's rebellion against God. That song will look back at what we now look forward upon. One day, think about this, the whole world will look back on the days of the tribulation. They might call them the, the dark times and shudder. And if that great tribulation will not have been limited to three and a half years by a sovereign God, the whole world would have been lost, none would have survived, and as Jesus said, even the elect would not have been saved. Heaven rejoices. These 144,000 Jews are victorious, invincible, celebrated, and fifthly, redeemed. Look at verse 3. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. And look down at verse 4. These have been purchased from among men. Both in verse 3 and verse 4, you have the word purchased. They are purchased from the earth. They are purchased from among men. That is, they are redeemed out of the world when the world will be at its worst. The worst society that has ever been. The worst immoralities, the worst sorceries and slaveries and tyrannies and corruptions. It will be the most loveless era of human history. Jesus said the love of many will wax cold. Mothers will hate their own daughters. Fathers will hate their sons. And they are purchased out of it. Purchased out of that dark society. Out of the bleak darkness of that world at its worst. And what is the purchase price? It is, of course, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look back at Revelation chapter 5. The same word purchase shows up there. Everyone in heaven singing. Verse 9. Worthy are you, singing to Jesus, to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. Listen, the only way 144,000 get there is by grace. Blood bought redemption. The purchase price was the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen, that's the only way anybody ever gets to heaven. By faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we believe that Jesus died in our place to actually pay for our sins. 
so that the perfect standard of God's law would be met, not by us, it could never be met by us, but be met by our substitute. His death in our place to make us fit for heaven. It's the only way. No human religion will ever work. No self-attainment can ever get there. You can't deserve it. You can't earn it. You can't pay God back. Price paid in full by the infinite value of the blood of Christ spilled at Calvary. That's the only way. If you're here this morning, you're, you're hearing about 144,000 people in the future who will have been purchased by the blood of Christ to be sealed and redeemed unto heaven. That payment is available to you who will believe, even today. These Jews are victorious, invincible, celebrated, redeemed, and pure. Number six, they are pure. Look at verse four. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They're not defiled. They're virgins. This is not a statement that uh, perpetual virginity is some sort of extra virtue. Marriage is not bad. Intimate marital relationships do not defile. Women, by their nature of being women, are not a defilement. That's not the point of this passage. But this is a unique setting, and a unique setting apart of a unique band of Jewish males at a specific point in future history for a specific purpose. And for God to set them apart for himself for these specific purposes, he sets them apart completely from the immoralities of the world, particularly from the very religious immoralities that will be prevalent during the tribulation and the world's pagan religions. Religious expression and sexual immorality went together. You went to the temple and you worshipped the deity by participating in immoralities. That will be the flavor of the religion in the last days. God is going to keep them from all of that, from a hint of any of that, by preserving them completely free from any sexual activity at all. God goes farther with this group in separating them out than he does with other groups. Do you remember the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7? He, he was single and he was free. And he said, I wish that all men were even as myself. However, each man has his own gift from God. He's talking about his own freedom and opportunities as a single man to go anywhere, be ready at any time to suffer greatly for the expansion of the gospel. He actually commends marriage as a good thing and for himself, strategically for his ministry, better to be single. In verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 7, he says, but only as the Lord has assigned to each one, so let him walk. And then in verse 25 of that same chapter, he says, now concerning virgins, I think that this is good in view of present distress. It is good for a man not to marry. Interesting, in Paul's own day, there was a season of such distress that the devotion and time required for marriage could have been problematic. I can't think of a more distressing nor strategic period of time in human history than the seven-year period of the tribulation. God has called for himself 144,000 Jewish males who will be sexually pure completely, for they will be virgins. Number seven, they will be dedicated. They will be dedicated. Look at verse four. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. In verse 4, you have the word these three times. It is emphatic. It's at the front of the sentence. It's an important place in the original. And it's as if uh, John is pointing out by the Holy Spirit, these ones, these ones, these ones, emphasizing their very unique role at this time. And what does he say about them here in, in verse 4? They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. That is, they are dedicated. They are loyal Whatever Jesus says, they do. He says, jump. They say, how high? They are at his behest. They are his slaves. They are marked out for his purposes. And if their task is evangelism, and I think it is, then they are ready and protected to go anywhere to proclaim the truth. 
Can you imagine 144,000 invincible missionaries heralding the truth, ready to stand in any court, face any man, travel to any location, endure any hardship, so that the lamb may receive the reward of his suffering? They are his special emissaries. So they go wherever he wants. These 144,000 Jews are victorious, invincible, celebrated, redeemed, pure, dedicated, and eighthly, first fruits. I couldn't come up with one word for first fruits. All I could think of was corn. You know, I like grilled corn. I think about harvest time. I like corn mazes. And you think about getting a, a fresh ear of corn from a local farm and grilling it on the grill with salt and pepper and butter just dripping. But corn would not have worked in this outline. <laughs> First fruits almost doesn't work because we kind of don't know what it is. Look at verse 4. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. What is a first fruit to God and to the Lamb? What is this all about? We have to know our Bibles a little bit here. You need to understand these 144,000 are not the only people who will believe the gospel during the tribulation. They are the first ones. And they are called first fruits. That is, they are the beginnings of Jews and Gentiles, martyrs and survivors, men and women, who will believe the gospel in a great end times harvest. These ones seem to be the precursor evangelists of that end times harvest. They are called first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And if you were this afternoon, perhaps, to read Deuteronomy 26, 1 to 11, you would discover there that when the, the harvest time came in, when the, when the crops were ready, the agricultural harvest was finished, the very first gleanings of this would be offered to Yahweh in thanksgiving. And, and why did they give the first? Giving God the first was the way to acknowledge that it was all truly belonging to Him. As all things are from him and through him and to him, so also the crops. We wouldn't have crops without God. This was an expression of gratitude and recognition. But the first fruits offerings and the first fruits celebrations were also the sign that the harvest was coming in. It was an appetizer of much more to come. The bountiful return for all the labor and waiting and plowing and sowing seed in anticipation of the harvest was now coming to fruition. And this picture of first fruits is used of, as a metaphor for lives, a spiritual harvest of souls. Paul uses it this way in 1 Corinthians 16, 15. He says, I urge you, brothers, you know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints. What is Paul describing? In a region where the gospel went, who were the first ones to believe, who became the seedbed for many more to believe? They were first fruits, spiritually speaking. And so the 144,000 in Revelation 14 are the first installment of a great harvest of Jewish and Gentile belief in the last days. And that Jewish belief is coming. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, Paul is describing the tragic situation of most of Israel having rejected Messiah and now the church being populated by Gentiles. Uh, that's most of us in this room, weird outsiders. <laughs> What's going on? Why do we get to benefit from the rich root of the olive tree? Paul says. Look at verse 25. He says, I do not want you brothers, perhaps mostly Gentiles in Rome at that time, I do not want you to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. What, what did Paul want a Gentile or a Jewish Gentile audience mix to understand? That a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved just as it is written, Old Testament prophets, New Testament prophecy, same story. The deliverer will come from Zion. 
That deliverer will remove ungodliness from Jacob, that's Israel, because it is covenantal. God says, this is my covenant or my severe, unbreakable, solemn, relational promise that I made with them, that I take away their sins. Paul says in the present church era, Jews who don't believe the gospel are actually enemies of the gospel, but they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Why? Verse 29, because the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Listen, God will come true on his promise. And when he brings in a world of Gentiles from every tongue and tribe and nation and people, when the times of the Gentiles are done, fulfilled, all Israel will be saved. Listen to Zechariah 12, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me, that is Yahweh, whom they have pierced, And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. What will happen at the end of the tribulation when Jesus returns? They will see Jesus and they will believe Jesus. They will believe the gospel en masse as a nation. Right as the glorious dawn of Messiah's reign is coming to earth. The 144,000 become the first installment of a vast harvest of redeemed people from Israel. They also become the first installment of a vast harvest of redeemed people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people during the tribulation. These 144,000 Jews are victorious, invincible, celebrated, redeemed, pure, dedicated, first fruits, and ninthly, They are true. Verse 5. No lie was found in their mouth. This is a contrast to the lies of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and the whole world. These 144,000 are true. They cannot be charged with falsehood. They have not given in to the great lie. They have not given in to the false religion. They have not believed the deception. John here is quoting from Zephaniah 3.13, which says this, The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. They will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. This is the remnant that will not lie and will make it into the glorious kingdom. Every word out of the dragon's mouth was a deception, but the words in the mouths of the 144,000 is the truth. They are true, and finally, they are blameless. Look at verse 5. They are blameless, the text tells us. That is not sinless, that is not perfect, but it does mean they are irreproachable. They have integrity. They have not compromised. To be without blame in their dedicated loyalty to Christ, in their consistent faithful heralding of the message of the gospel... They will have been very obviously Christ's, marked, separated, protected, uncompromising, not lying. And all of this is a triumph of grace. The 144,000 will not be marked by these 10 characteristics because of human constitution or resolve or willpower. As Rahab, Noah, and Lot These are ones rescued out of destruction. As Enoch, these are ones that walk with God during a downward spiral of worldwide depravity. As Joseph in the Old Testament and Paul in the New Testament, these are uncompromising and persecuted. And as Daniel, they are faithful heralds of God's triumphs above all earthly powers. Can you imagine a world of 144,000 Daniels? Can you imagine the influence of the integrity, the heralding of the truth, and the untouchability until God's done? Here they are at the end of their race, and they will have finished well. Friend, will you? Will you finish your race well? Your race is different. 
different time, different track, perhaps a different ending. For them, their loyalties will be obvious. It will be very clear who belongs to Jesus and who doesn't. Not so obvious for us now. It's possible to look like a Christian, smell like a Christian, talk like a Christian, and not be a Christian, and show up in heaven and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this and this and this and this and this in your name? And what will Jesus say in response to many? Depart from me. I never knew you. It's easy to come to church, dress up, look like Christians around you, absorb Christian culture, fool others, maybe fool yourself for a time. But are you truly set apart? Do you belong to him by faith? Have you been purchased by his blood? How do you know that? You can ask about your loyalties to Christ. Are you a dedicated disciple? Are you about his business in this world? What is the purity of your moral conduct? Is there integrity of speech and life? Are you interested in discerning the lies of the culture around us and living according to the truth? Are you above reproach in your behavior? A Christian, by definition, is one who has been rescued out of the world, who is no longer of the world, while he remains in the world. Is that true of your life? Are you committed to the Lamb's great commission? And these 144,000 will be invincible while they proclaim the gospel to a world at its worst. You and I are invincible as long as God has us here. Have you taken up the task for which Jesus has left you on the earth? He commissioned the 11 and by proxy all of us to be his ambassadors, his representatives, his heralds of good news while we're here. Are you living up to the reason for which you've been redeemed and remain? Listen, it will be easy for God to secure his 144,000. Do you believe that? We just read the details. They get sealed in chapter 7. They make it all the way to the end in chapter 14. That's easy for God. He seals them. They're sealed. Who could break that? There are other descriptions of the sealing work of salvation. The seal of God, the seal of the Holy Spirit is a down payment, a deposit in the life of every believer. It doesn't mean like the 144,000 during the tribulation that you won't be killed for Christ. But it does mean you will never be separated from the love of God in Christ. Death will not separate you from Him. When we read about the sealing of God in Ephesians chapter 1, we understand that Just as it is easy for God to seal his slaves in the worst era yet to come, it is easy for God to seal you, believer, here. To preserve you eternally secure. To cause you to stand, in the words of Jude 24, in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for victory assured. There are many battles yet ahead. Battles with our own hearts as we fight with sin. Battles with the world as we seek to be in and not of. There are enemies lurking and lying. There is the company of saints and encouragement and fellowship along the way. Sometimes we are discouraged in our fight with sin, in our resistance to the world's deceptions. We wonder how long can we really go. We know that your grace is sufficient for these things and your power is perfected in our weakness. And we long to persevere. But we are so thankful, Lord, even as we hold on by faith with a white knuckle grip to the truths of your word, that you are faithful to preserve You keep us. You secure us. We're thankful that we too are victorious. You even call all of us who hold on to Jesus by faith overcomers. We are already that and we will inherit all the blessings of eternal life 
because of the work of your son who bled on our behalf. We thank you for these things. And now to you who are able to keep us from stumbling and to make us stand in the presence of your glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.